Hello again. Today we're going over the Roaring Twenties. World War I is over. The good guys won. The bad guys lost. And let's see what happens next. And let's start with the economic situation. I know economics are boring, but, you know, we have to do it. Now, Woodrow Wilson is going to be unsuccessful in getting the United States to join the League of Nations. As I mentioned last time, he goes on a nationwide tour. He gets sick. He has a stroke. His wife ends up running the country. Uh, not only does he not get the United States to join the League of Nations, but the United States also does not sign the Treaty of Versailles. So 1920. Surprisingly, Woodrow Wilson actually wanted to run for a third term, but he was talked out of it because his health was so delicate. So we have two brand new candidates. We've got the Republican, Warren G. Harding. He was a U.S. Senator from Ohio. And then we have a Democrat named James Cox. He was the governor of Ohio. So we have two people from Ohio trying to be president in 1920. Warren G. Harding wins. He gets 404 electoral college votes. James Cox only gets 127. The progressive era ends right here. The 1920s is a return to big business and those progressive changes that have been happening since about 1900, they just grind to a halt. In fact, Harding's campaign slogan is very famous, and it's a return to normalcy. But what it really meant is a return to corporate America. Now, there's a global recession that hits from 1918 to 1922. Most of that has to do with the ending of war production in Europe. It's helped by just the fact that the French and the German countrysides are destroyed. Fighting is going on in Russia. And Europe's basically trying to put itself back together. The European economy does not really get better until the mid-1920s, but in America... 1922 is basically when we're back on track. Now, the assembly line is going to boost productivity by about 40%. Uh, the Heinz Corporation in Pittsburgh is going to be using a form of the assembly line. The Ford Corporation in Detroit is going to be using a form of the assembly line. There's also an increase in corporate mergers. Um, during the 1920s, basically the top 100 corporations control more than 50% of all American business. And that's going to lead to oligopolies. An oligopoly is when just a couple of companies control an entire market. If you want to look at a current day oligopoly, cell phones or internet service are good ways to look at it. When you think of cell phones, there are really only big three big players with a fourth one far behind. You've got Verizon, AT&T, and T-Mobile. And then U.S. Cellular is kind of that fourth one that's way, way far behind. Now you might say, but there's all these other companies out there. In reality, they just run on the backbones of the first three companies. So that's kind of what an oligopoly is. Now what these oligopolies are able to do is they're able to fix the prices, meaning artificially raise the price. They can divide the market, which is very much what internet providers do. If you live in an area that has Spectrum, you very likely cannot get Comcast. If you live in a place with Comcast, you very likely cannot get AT&T, um, whatever they call theirs, so on and so on. These oligopolies also stop small chains from growing and in many cases put small chains out of business. So these bigger chain stores like Macy's, Montgomery Wards, Sears, JCPenney, they all become the main way that business is done. And the same thing happens in the grocery 
economy as well. Larger chains start to take over from the mom and pop stores. And then advertising gets huge and leads to big business sales. And I have in the in the slide here a link you can click on uh, to look at some advertising examples from the 1920s. And personal opinion, advertising in the 1920s was absolutely gorgeous. These vibrant colors, these overly smiling faces, but that's what was used to encourage and get this growth going. There's also the idea of installment buying plans. Uh, we do still have these today. Uh, for example, if you buy something and they give you six months to pay it off, uh, that's what an installment buying plan is. And even if you don't have the money up front, if you have the money long term, you can buy pretty much anything you want. And that's going to drive the post-war economy as well. So in many ways, business becomes the business of America. Labor, about 25% of women are still going to work during the 1920s. Now, women who do the same or similar jobs to men are going to earn much less. Women start to fill jobs as secretaries, as typists, as filing clerks. And then you also start to get women working as teachers, nurses, social workers. And even though one out of every four women is working, almost none of those women are going to make it into management. Organized labor has a pretty rough decade. Organized labor is not very successful. Membership starts to fall. By the end of the decade, membership has fallen to about 3 million. And a lot of that is because businesses start to offer perks, such as paid time off, maybe some sort of recreational sports, you know, like teams, work softball or team softball, something like that. Stock options, whatever it is. But management's going to discourage the growth of unions by giving employees stuff. Now, wages begin to rise slowly, but if you're considered an unskilled worker, you don't see much of these improvements most of the wages are going to rise for skilled professionals. Then you have post-war agriculture. Agriculture does pretty bad in the 1920s. Uh, the 1910s weren't great for the farmers except for World War I. 1920s, many ways worse than 19 teens. After the war, American farm production is way higher than it needs to be. During World War I, farmers were encouraged to plant goods because that food could be sent over to Europe. After World War I is over, American farmers are still producing at that ridiculously high rate, but nobody's buying the food. To make it worse, the farmers can't slow down production because of all the investments they've made, all the debt they have, and all the equipment they have. It's very hard to lower your yield of food when the modern equipment just helps you produce so much. On top of that, there are natural disasters especially here in the south, the bull weevil. And if you've never seen a bull weevil, that's a picture one. There are some ugly looking bugs. Uh, by 1922, the bull weevil has struck the entire south. It basically sticks its, its uh, nose into the, the uh, leaf, sucks out all the sap, and then lays its eggs and kills cotton plants. Now, if that's not enough, we also have bad farming practices. Uh, basically, there was no crop rotation. There was no letting the ground rest. It was just use the field every single year. 
Eventually this leads to soil erosion and it leads to all the nutrients being leached out of the soil so nothing grows. And that's going to become a problem when we get into the early 1930s with the Dust Bowl. Then last but not least, you would expect Congress or the government to try and help the farmers. And there is the attempt to pass something called the McNary Haugen Farm Bill. And this was to help farmers by propping up prices and it was going to let the government buy excess food. Well, Congress attempts to pass this McNary Haugen Farm Relief Bill in 1924, 1926, 1927, and 1928. It only passes once, and the one time it passes, it's vetoed by the president at the time, a man named Calvin Coolidge. So Congress is not worried about helping farmers. And the one time they do get that law passed, the president was not worried about helping farmers. Society and culture is a little bit more exciting. And if you notice in Blackboard, there is a document called Slang of the 1920s. You're not going to be tested on that or anything, but I always try to hand that out when I'm doing this lecture, whether it's in person or online, just because I think it's interesting how many words and how many sayings we still use today that were used in the 1920s. But um, society and culture. By 1920, there are more people living in cities for the first time than in rural areas. The city becomes the center of American culture. And in many ways, you would recognize the America of the 1920s. You would be able to exist fairly easily in the 1920s, except your cell phones wouldn't work and you wouldn't have the internet. But there's radio, there's movies, there's advertisements, there's magazines, and this is everywhere street corners, on the sides of buses, on billboards, you name it. There are consumer goods that have transformed society. You get your first true electrical appliances. This is when refrigeration comes into vogue. People start having washing machines and dryers and things like that, air conditioning. Supermarkets and commercial bakeries become the primary food source. Uh, so instead of going to a mom and pop shop or a farmer's market or a street market, you start going to grocery stores and I think either Piggly Wiggly or A&P the, was the first true supermarket. It's one of those two. People don't bake their own bread anymore. Uh, you just go to, the, to a bakery and get it or these bakeries are going to supply breads to the supermarkets and you just buy it there. The automobile is going to radically change the way Americans live. For the first time, Americans have to deal with traffic jams, parking problems, accidents, and insurance. But in reality, the automobile, it's going to allow people to move further, go faster, and it increases the spread of suburban America. Now, with all of these electrical supplies, with the automobiles, there's a rise in coal production, there's a rise in oil production, there's a rise in natural gas production, and then along with that comes a rise in pollution. Now, if you're an everyday worker, the assembly line is gonna make your life a little less filling because you're gonna sit there all day and you're gonna do the same thing all day. Each person on the assembly line just does the same task over and over and over and over again, and then you go home. So I can imagine it would probably be a little bit monotonous and probably a little bit boring, especially if that's a brand new thing for you. Now, mass entertainment's gonna be pretty important. There are some very big, important magazines that come out in the 1920s. There's the Saturday Evening Post, which existed up until, I think, the 1970s, maybe even 1918s. It was one of the most popular magazines of the day. Life Magazine, which was discontinued in the 80s, and Reader's Digest, which is still produced today. All these magazines, they had bright advertisements. They were read from coast to coast. 
They had news stories, gossip columns, and it's in many ways one of those things that made our country smaller and made everybody more connected. Even more than that are radio shows. Uh, NBC and CBS were the two primary radio networks. The first commercial radio network goes on the air in 1920 in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And suddenly radio spreads coast to coast and everybody is listening to the same shows. Everybody is listening to the same commercials, the same advertisements. The first big radio hit was called Amos and Andy, and it was broadcast in 1928. And eventually Amos and Andy is going to become a TV show when we get into the 1950s. Movies are a huge, huge draw for audiences. And they're going to be used to kind of shape and reflect American values and American culture. Uh, the Jazz Singer is the first movie to have the spoken parts synced with the video. Uh, before The Jazz Singer, you would have like um, images on the screen that tell you what is being said. And then very often there would be a orchestra in the movie theater to help with the music. But The Jazz Singer, for the first time, is going to put dialogue and music and movie together. And honestly, The Jazz Singer is a pretty good movie. Uh, the lead character is um, Al Jolton. Uh, he's the biggest actor of the 1920s and 30s. He is a Jewish guy who wants to become a jazz singer. Singing jazz was looked down on at the time. Um, Al Jolson goes out and becomes a singer and then at the end he has to reconcile with his parents when they're on um, their deathbeds. Now the one problem with with the jazz singer is Al Jolton uh, he does don blackface he does uh, put on dark face paint which today is a big no-no um, but for that time period it was still wrong but it wasn't looked at as wrong if that makes any sense. Uh, in many ways, the jazz singer just shows how far our cultural awareness has come since then, which is a very, very good thing. We have cults of personality that are going to develop. Uh, you've probably heard of Babe Ruth, one of the best baseball players of all time. Jack Dempsey, who was one of the best boxers of all time. And then Charles Lindbergh. He's famous for flying across the Atlantic Ocean, and he becomes so famous that in the 19... 30s that his child is actually going to be kidnapped and held for ransom. When people think of the 1920s, they very often think of flappers. And uh, Betty Boop here is kind of the quintessential flapper caricature. Uh, she's a very famous cartoon character through 1920s through the 1940s. And the term flapper, it actually comes from Britain. It was used to describe women who were more promiscuous than the previous generation. These are going to be women who party, drink, wear short dresses, wear makeup, and kind of flaunt their sexuality. And the look of the flapper changes a little bit, but more or less, it's going to be makeup, bright red lipstick, eyeshadow, uh, short hair, a dress, and maybe like a one-piece undergarment. Women were also known to wrap themselves up to make their figure look smaller, if you will. And in many ways, these women are trying to flaunt their sexuality while at the same time looking more masculine. It's, it's a very interesting dynamic. And here are some pictures of your typical flappers. You see some flappers drinking, you see flappers with short hair. Uh, in the middle you have the flappers wearing the like one piece um, nightwear if you will. So and the revealing bathing suits as well. That's that's kind of what flapper culture looked like there. 
Now, moving on, we have the, these people who are known as the Lost Generation. Uh, they're going to be a series of writers. Uh, you've got F. Scott Fitzgerald, who wrote The Great Gatsby, Sinclair Lewis, who wrote, wrote Babbitt, Ernest Hemingway, A Farewell to Arms, and E.E. E. Cummings, who wrote uh, Tulips and Chimneys. Uh, all of these are going to grow up during World War I. Uh, they're going to serve in many places in World War I. And they kind of see all this pointless death. They have experienced the world and they, they don't see how traditional America can exist in the new reality. And these authors are going to write about their World War I experience. Uh, very often they're going to write about these parties, gender roles, and they're going to look back at the past with almost like rose-tinted glasses, if you will. Um, it's really all about how the American dream doesn't really conform to the new world. And some of those books are very, very good. You've probably read Great, Great Gatsby. I've had to read Babbitt two or three times. Um, they're very good books for the time period. Along with that, we have the Harlem Renaissance with uh, poets like Langston Hughes and Zora Neale Hurston. Uh, these are going to be black authors that examine their experiences. They celebrate their ethnicity and they idolize uh, African-American culture and they bring African-American culture to a larger audience. And they're going to do this using short poems. Uh, they're going to do this using poetry, uh, books, novels, and even painting and artistic examples. Now, the problem is uh, most of this work is going to be bought by white patrons who don't really take the time to understand what these authors were trying to say, which means a lot of the intended message just kind of goes over the heads of some people. Now, the Harlem Renaissance really doesn't end until 1929 with the stock market crash. And the New York City and especially Harlem were hit very, very hard by the Great Depression. There's a lot of unemployment, a lot of poverty, and riots and racial uh, tension as well. We also have something called the Southern Renaissance. It's uh, authors like William Faulkner, Tennessee Williams, uh, Margaret Mitchell, who wrote Gone with the Wind. And this is a re-examination of the Civil War and an attempt to move on from the Civil War. It's People who are trying to write objectively and look at race relations, look at how Reconstruction failed them, and look at the myth of the Civil War. And this is going to be the first group of Southern writers who are going to write against the lost cause. And the lost cause is um, in many ways still controversial today, it turns out. But these authors here are willing to say, look, what happened happened and we need to move on. And one of the ways they're going to move on is they're going to say there's a lack of education in the South and this needs to be corrected. And William Faulkner, Margaret Mitchell, Tennessee Williams are some, some of the uh, most widely read authors today. There are some other artistic movements. Uh, architectural advances are going to lead to what we know today as the modern skyscraper. Uh, there's Frank Lloyd Wright, who is one of the most famous architects of all time. He creates this idea known as prairie style. And that's actually the type of architecture I grew up with. And I've got two pictures of prairie style houses here. They've got lots of windows, these sharp edges, and these overhang porches. There's another group called Datists who are just going to kind of create art without meaning. And um, Datist art is just weird. Not bad weird, but weird. It's very different. And I've got a link there you can look at too. And then we have jazz. Jazz is one of the first places where white culture and black culture can come together. Um, jazz gives black musicians an audience and jazz gives a way for our world to come together. And by the way, jazz is really fun to listen to, and really fun to play as well. 
Now there are some counter reactions. So there are some of the older generation who speak up. Um, a lot of these changes are done with the younger generations. The older generations don't understand really why their kids are rejecting traditional values. A lot of it has to do with who did or did not serve in World War I. Rural areas tend to stay religious and in many cases turn to religious fundamentalism. And one of the best places to see this turn to religious fundamentalism is in a very famous court case that happens in 1925. And that's known as the Scopes Monkey Trial. It happens in Dayton, Ohio. And the school board of Dayton, Ohio decides that it will be illegal to teach evolution. So evolution, anti-evolution laws have been passed and the ACLU convinces a biology teacher named John T. Scopes to teach evolution. This is very much a made for TV trial, if you will. Both sides knew what was happening and it was really meant to purposely challenge these laws. So you have the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, and they're going to find a gentleman named Clarence Darrow, who was one of the most, most um, influential and biggest civil rights lawyers of the day. And the school board of Dayton, Ohio, or not Dayton, Ohio, but Dayton, Tennessee, is going to come up with William Jennings Bryant. Yes, this is the same William Jennings Bryan we have been talking about basically all semester. Uh, by this time, William Jennings Bryan is fairly old. He's fairly frail, but he's still one of the best lawyers out there. And in the, in the Scopus Monkey Trial, it happens in the middle of summer. It is extremely hot. It is so popular that it ends up being held outdoors. William Jennings Bryan is actually going to take the stand as a defendant, which is extremely unusual. And in the end, Scopes is going to be found guilty of breaking the law. But the, the fine is very small. It's only $100. The state of Tennessee's case is so poorly done that basically William Jennings Bryan humiliates himself. And it shows in many ways that this religious fundamentalism was too conservative for the day. I think that's a good way to put it. Um, but the trial is very, very heavily watched around the country. Okay, so what's next? We have this week, week seven or lesson seven, where you have your chapter 22 discussion, your chapter 22 quiz, and your second reflection paper. The second reflection paper can cover any of the readings from week four, week five, week six, week seven. So the decadence of imperialism by Calderon, uh, the progressive area era, the whole house or the why women should vote, uh, World War I is the uh, Senator Norris reading about the war or the 14 points. And then for the new era, we have the um, Flappers Appeal to Parents is what it's called, which is a very, very good article. So just a quick reminder on what our flex paper should be. 
Uh, one and a half pages double spaced is where you want to go. Uh, the first paragraph is just telling me uh, which article you're doing in a quick summary. And then the rest of it, about a page long, should be your thoughts, your opinions, your ideas on that reading, whether you liked it, disliked it, et cetera, et cetera. Next week, no class. We would normally be meeting in class for the first time next Tuesday, but we have a teacher meeting on Tuesday, or an instructor meeting, if you will, so no classes are gonna be held on the second. So the first time we will ever meet in person will be on the 9th, and it is the midterm. Now, I will try to put out a short um, study guide, or at least tell you what's gonna be on the midterm, uh, and how do you study? The best thing to do is to go back and watch these videos because everything is going to become, uh, all of the questions are going to come from the, the information I've given you. All right, that's it. 31 minutes or so. You're probably tired of hearing me, so I'll stop. Any questions, give me an, um, a message on Blackboard, send me an email, and I'll be sure to get back to you as quick as I can. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.